Now this auto by three months after the screw breakage, the fracture starts healing and the, everything is well. He is lucky this fracture is healed up. Now comminuted fracture do not dynamize, but if it is not healing, graft it. Now you can see here, this is a comminuted fracture which was not healing. And if you dynamize, what happens? The nail so much has come out and the fracture has compacted. So you have achieved actually the shortening. And that shortening which has occurred, which is not acceptable in a lower limb. So if the if it is a comminuted fracture like this, never dynamize. If it is not healing, put in the bone graft here, and then only you expect it to heal up, or you can put in a supplementary plate because the fixation here is not very good. But do not dynamize a comminuted fracture. You dynamize a comminuted fracture, this is what has happened. It will overlap. It was here very well fixed. It will overlap and you will get a shortening. So instead of that, what do you do? This was a comminuted fracture I treated on day one. It was, uh, as you can see here, this was comminuted. I put in a nail. I put a nail in distraction. You can see you, you measure the opposite side. This is many, 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 many years back. This is 2000. This is in 1390. You can see that. You keep it in distraction so that the limb length is maintained. If you go down and try to do it, open reduction there and try to get the two, all these fragments together, this may affect the healing process. So having done that, now you put the graft after a few weeks and the whole thing will heal up without any shortening. So you have the best chance in a comminuted fracture to not dynamize and you have a best chance to get a normal healing process with the length which is maintained. Now you can see here, fracture is without dynamization also. So dynamization is not a must. You can see majority of the time the fracture heals up without dynamization. Or if you put in a dynamic mode, the screw, then it heals up very well. Or now you can see here, even if you dynamize, this will not work because this, these wires will come in the way. Obviously, this is not a good nailing because only two screws down below, one screw, it should have gone way all the down. And you can see that the reason why this is a bad nailing, there is a defect here. And here, try to put the middle medulla. So this will not allow again dynamization, even if you want to do dynamization. Same thing is here. Even if you want to do dynamization in this non-healing fracture, it will not allow. If the medial medulla has not been fixed, the TBI has not been fixed, the fibula has not been fixed. So th this is the disaster. This is the time when people were still learning how to do the nailing. So even if dynamize, it may not work. If one of these holes, which there was a screw, but other hole which was there, it is filled up with bone, then it cannot allow. Or from the fracture site, if the piece of bone has traveled down, this will form a block, so the nail will not travel down. Or it is subchondral, as I mentioned to you earlier. Or there is a bone plug has formed already here. You can see there is too big amount of bone has formed at the end of the nail. So even if it is dynamized, this will not be effective. And the, the dynamization proximally, if the bone formation has occurred, will not be possible to do the dynamization. So till now, nail has to have a space to migrate up or down after dynamization. At the time of index operation, keep nail short of a subchondral bone in a mid shaft fracture. If it is a fracture is way here, you can keep it short and allow it to dynamize if you want to dynamize later on. Or I'll come to again, but here you can see 24 months have gone till the fracture is not held up. But you can see here, even if the surgeon has dynamized, you can see here newborn formation is occurred here. Then the newborn formation has occurred, the nail will not travel down. There's the reason the dynamization will not work. Same thing as that, same thing which you can see in a magnified view. This is the nail, at the tip of the nail, you will get to see this bone plug. And that, that is the bone plug. That's the reason, with the, even with dynamization, it will not work. So subchondral bone, it will not work. So if at all you want to treat this, easiest way is now you have a track. And if the fracture is way higher up, 
exchange nailing with the short nail and there is already a track in a dynamic mode, don't put any screws digitally, then it can be easily, you will be able to get the fracture healing without any problem. So in a nutshell, transverse fracture is the isthmus. I am talking about, please understand at the isthmus. Isthmus is where there is a cavity is the smallest and at there the fracture occurs where the nail hold is highest two inches above and two inches below the fracture. When the nail hold is good, that is the isthmus fracture. Treatment is reamed 1 to 1.5 larger, adequate size nail, not a canal stuffing nail, pushed by hand and not hammered, except only at the end. In a dynamic mode, dynamic mode means the screw away from the fracture in that oval hole. That is the one which is in a dynamic mode. Full weight bearing on day one. And please, again, I'm telling, isthmus fracture, transverse fracture, where the hold of the nail is very good, two inches above and two inches below. Put two or three screws, whatever you want to put proximally, and put distally in the dynamic hole. This cannot be done into the lower one-third fractures or upper one-third fractures. This I am talking about purely the middle third, middle isthmus fracture where the hold of the nail is very good above. Forget it. The fracture will heal up. So, in short, <coughs> rim 430 and nail 410. So, that you have reamed it, you put it in a dynamic mode. So, there is a place for the nail to travel down and this will heal up without any major problem. Today, every isthmus fracture, I treat like this. I do not do a static nailing at all. I do a dynamic nailing on day one. But this is not valid for comminuted fractures. This is not valid for junctional fractures. This is valid only for the isthmus fracture, transverse fracture. Comminuted or a butterfly or a, a long oblique fracture, even at the isthmus, this is not valid. So repeat, transverse fracture with good bone-to-bone -bone reduction, there is no need to do a static locking, only do a dynamic locking. That is the, put the screw in the oval hole away from the fracture and away from the fracture you can see here. So that the fracture will be allowed to compress here. You can see this fracture, all which we had to do was that fracture which was treated in a dynamic mode, exchange nailing and the fracture heals up. This is all what was needed for this. If this was done on a day one, a dynamic nail, in, because there is a isthmus fracture, this would have healed up very well. So in conclusion, dynamization is not a must for healing. If need, dynamize early by six weeks. Nail must have a space to travel for a dynamization to work. Isthmus fracture, do a dynamic nail on day one and allow the person to walk about. This is about the dynamization. So once you see the dynamization, today, I hardly ever do a dynamization on my own patient. On somebody's patient, I may do it. But dynamization is effective only with prerequisite that the nail has a place to migrate. If six, eight weeks have gone by, more than six to eight weeks, either there is a bone plug has formed or some something has happened there so that there, even if you dynamize, nail will not travel down. So the dynamization will not be effective and there is no point in dynamizing. And again, there is no point in dynamizing in the fracture which is lower down or very high up. High up, you may be able to dynamize. Lower down the fracture, dynamization is dicey. I will not say it will not work. It may work at times, but at times it may angulate the fracture if in case you dynamized it too early. That's the reason why the dynamization is mainly for the isthmus fracture and for the fracture lower down. It may work, may not work. You have to take it, uh, you have to take it like that. Any questions on dynamization or any, anybody wants to add up anything? Gadi to add, it's a very crystal clear lecture and uh, there is nothing to add again. May I ask a question, sir? Anybody? Yes, yes, please ask. Uh, 
uh, if the dynamization distally for a short fragment is difficult uh, because of some bony block or some implant obstructing its path or if it is a subcontrol we can dynamize it from proximal sir no from proximal side but you can do that Ah, sir. If the fracture is not absolutely transverse and it is oblique, then it will translate also. So okay. we have to put extra polaris to while dynamization. That is the reason I am saying that dynamization is mainly meant for a transverse fracture or a short oblique fracture, and mainly for the isthmus fracture. And when to add augmentation plate? If it is oblique, then adding of augmentation plate will help. I mean, so this is, this fracture is on that overkill. I'm the, coming to that junctional fractures. Anybody has a thing about the isthmus fracture which I spoke just now? Can we do sir a dynamization even after ten or twelve weeks? You can Because do it. it. You can do it, but the chances of success. Are not very high because by the six weeks it is first follow up of the patient. It's difficult to convince and difficult to judge whether the fracture is healing well. Everybody wants to wait, especially young surgeon. If you wait for that reason for ten weeks and twelve weeks, generally the bone block formation occurs at the end of the bone, at the end of the nail, and that dynamization will not be effective. It is most effective if it is done at six weeks time. Is there any clinical test? How to judge that the bone is healing well? It needs dynamization clinically. No, there is no way you can make it out clinically. It is radiologically the absence of any callus formation or sufficient callus formation. If there is some signs of healing in six to eight weeks time, that is the one which works better after dynamization. Thank you. But still, it is dicey. Even if there is no sign of healing. You, as I showed you two two cases, uh, if the, there is no no attempted healing, but still once you dynamize, it started healing. So the uh, the that the why I am telling about is that isthmus fracture on day one put the nail into the dynamic mode, and screw into the dynamic mode, and then there is no question of dynamizing it later on. Sir, any clue regarding sir any pain tenderness at the fracture site? Is it? Uh... Yeah, I think if the fracture is not healing, if it is mainly it is a radiological decision, because if it is well nailed, you may not get any pain at the fracture site, unless you have a deep pressure, then he may get pain. But while walking, he may not get pain. But you will see that X-rays do not show sufficient signs of healing in eight weeks time. Uh, eight or six, six. Yes, yes. Means we have to wait around six to eight weeks. Uh, on first follow up, we should take the decision whether to dynamize or not. Chances of dynamization being successful are better if it is done early. Okay, sir. Sir, ये ये करने असीम ही है. आप बोलो गुरु जी बोलो. Ah, how do you take into account? A fracture which has been just as stable transverse fracture, but there is some hidden comminution when you are reaming. You are trying to pass a eleven nail. Most Indian nails will have to ream up to thirteen. So that uh, comminution or fracture lines extending, which uh, occur during surgery, and if you miss them, then there will be a lot of trouble. So uh, as a policy. i do the static locking most of the time and the literature is very clear that a well done nailing statically locked has not increased the non union rate almost 98% union rate with properly done nailing not in distraction i said that the dynamizer is not a must it only yeah. a percentage of people you need dynamization but what you mentioned is about when you have created a fracture at that time you have to do static nailing Now, yeah. missed yeah. fracture. I am talking about missed. That you are not able to judge those uh, cracks which you have created because of the reaming. 
that in a good CRM you will be always be able to pick it up. I don't think you yeah. it is hidden. And in order to bypass that hidden fracture, you want to do static magnetic. Sir, uh, may I? Yes, yes, please. Uh, sir, in case of comminuted fracture, our first uh, aim is to distract or maintain the length of the fracture. If the need arises after six to eight weeks, uh, when the callus is visible on X-ray, can we di start dynamization instead of bone grafting? Yes, that's if right. there is callus. No. Get sorting <clears throat> and then to do Alizara after the fracture heals up, I think it's too much of a time which the patient will have to spend. I would always do the grafting for terminated fracture and not try to do dynamization and collapse and accept the one inch of shorting. And those situations, if I graft, it's hardly ever alone. It's an additional plate also. It's always a plate. If, yeah, if I'm going down, he's giving me another chance. I graft and put a plate also, additional. Augment. Okay. Because in a comminuted fracture, the tendency is that let the first fracture heal up. That is, I think, patient undergoes a lot of problems time which is consumed in order to do that. So I feel that in a community sector, two, three, four, four, distally, will be also a better option. Do you ring with the hand reamer or power reamer, sir? I always do. <laughs> with? Because the hand reamer in a femur, which is a bowing, which will not be able to pass through after a few inches in the isthmus. What is the most common or common? Yes. Yogesh, Yogesh, can you mute yourself? Yeah, tell me now, speak again. Sir, repeat please. Do you deal with the hand reamer or power reamer? I always use the power reamer. Okay. But reaming the. Sorry. Come again. Reaming the distal part of the femur, just above the uh, uh, knee joint. It is very difficult because when we ring, we go up, uh, just up, uh, below the isthmus and then just put the nail. We what don't ring up to the. What I am trying to tell you. That in the femur, the hand reamer, which are solid, you will not be able to negotiate the small curve which is there in the femur. So you will go only up to the isthmus and you will tend to put in a thinner nail. While if you have the power reamer, then you will be able to ream it properly and you will be able to put in an 11 number nail, which is the ideal nail for a femur majority of the times. Nine number of nail if you have to put in a femur. Unless the maxillary cavity is very thin and you cannot ream it out also, then only the nine number of nail which is to be done. Otherwise, ten number is the minimum I feel you should put the nail in a femur. And in tibia? Tibia is all right. Eight, eight is all right. Eight, eight, eight and up. But nine is the ideal. But eight, occasionally we'll have to put in eight. Thank you, sir. So when you do PFN, do if you are doing a short PFN, then do you ream whole or only ream the proximal part and insert the nail directly? Short PFN in a slightly porotic patient, you have to ream only proximally. You don't have to ream distally. But unless you see if it is a atypical fracture where there is a medullary cavity is blocked, if you see it in a good CR, you will be able to see the medullary cavity is blocked. In that situation, you will have to ream right up to the level in which you want to pass the nail. Or in an occasionally very thin medullary cavity, then you'll have to ream because even, in, even a nine number nail, you may not be able to pass at times. Otherwise, majority of the elderly, when you do the short PFN, you don't have to ream the, anything more than the proximal part. Sir, uh, for uh, shaft fracture, what is preferred uh, position of patient, sir? Uh, do do it in lateral position or on a traction table always, sir? See, on the traction table, the reduction and everything is very easy. 
but you can do it on a not uh, on a ordinary table with a few people giving you the traction and if you have a f tool or if you have a reduction tool you will need those tools but that also in a shaft isthmus fracture is going to be difficult to get that traction while it is in a lower one third fracture then even you can do without the traction table this will be all right i always do on a traction table the isthmus fracture okay sir that Yes, but I feel that for tibia eight, especially the Indian eight is too thin a nail. Most of the time is ten, and sometimes I have to compromise and pass nine. Eight mm nail Indians, they are even the bolts are three point five. They are not even four point five. See what happens, Asim so, is G. they are not using a flexible reamer. That's yes. a must. You can't do a proper nailing without having even even Indian reamers are very good now. Indian companies they make good reamers. Last thing is that they they don't have a flexible reamer. If you don't have a flexible reamer, then you, even tibia also it will be difficult to ream unless yeah. you take it like that. It is impossible. Is impossible. And femur also half the time it's a twelve mm nail and half the time or even forty percent. 11 60% but the, as you rightly said you have to ream 1.5 plus so uh, unless you have flexible reamer you can't do it in a cyrus type of a nail yeah comparatively a bigger bow you may have to ream up to 2 plus 2 plus yeah do you want to add up anything garigone sir everything is covered asim at i agree with the asim actually now the majority of the people the concept the The cavity is changing now, so I use mostly 10 mm nail for yeah. tibia. Yeah. 10 mm because after reaming, I ream 11, put 10. If I put a 10, then I put 9. So now I see in the my majority of the cases is 10, 80 percent, 20 percent is the 9 in practice. Exactly, and I think an orthopedic surgeon has no reason today. to not use a flexible reamer when the even indian decent flexible reamers are available you may not be if the cost is the issue indian reamers are fairly fairly good indian reamers are available it's impossible it increases to... the chance of fat embolism sorry flexible reamer increases the chance of fat embolism reduces High quality reamers they reduce actually Simran type modern reamers and the reamers also I think the if my observation is reamer is taken twenty five my I am working in five star four five star hospitals when we ask to change the reamer after twenty years of use they say we reamer to chalta hai apna somebody some even orthopedic surgeons will tell me that the reamer to chalta hai I think the reamer which is used for twenty years never sharpen Hardly ever we can sharpen the reamer. You, there is a time enough that you you should use a sharp reamer, so you change it for a newer reamer, where particularly the cost is not the issue. Actually, sir, in the setup I work, hardly anybody puts a twelve in the femur or uh, uh, those thicker nails. So once I cross that eleven mm reamer, then the reamers are very sharp. Hardly ever used. But, <laughs> but even even otherwise, except for Smith and Nevio, thirteen number nail is hardly available with anybody. Yeah, twelve twelve is the norm. It is available. Indian setup twelve is not available. Eleven. Yeah, twelve also is not available in the Indian nail. In some setup, yes. Eleven is available. Nine, ten, eleven. Uh, Pimar ka Pimar ko available. Pimar ka bara aata. <coughs> बारह आता अभी तेरा भी मैन्युफैक्चर कर एक्सेलेंट इंडियन इम्प्लांट्स हैव बीन मैन्युफैक्चर्ड बाय सम ऑफ दोस पीपल्स आई डोंट आई आई डोंट वांट टू नेम एंड दोस बट दोस रियली गुड कंपनीज दे मैन्युफैक्चर एक्सेलेंट इम्प्लांट्स व्हिच आर सपोज्ड टू बी एट पार विद द फॉरेन इम्प्लांट्स एंड द कॉस्ट इज आल्सो इज नॉट वेरी चीप दे पुट इट स्लाइटली चीपर देन द फॉरेन इम्प्लांट्स एंड बट दे देयर द गुड क्वालिटी नो क्वेश्चन अबाउट इट But when the people who work with the cost constraint, they are the ones who have to do quite a lot of sacrifice, which I can understand that. But then what happens is, instruments buying is from your money. 
implant buying may be from the patient's money. But the instrument buying, at least you, you should not try to economize on that because uh, most orthopedic surgeons can afford CM and the instruments in orthopedics. Quite a lot of instruments, even the drug companies, or I'm sorry, the instrument companies bring them. So those, it is different thing. Like if I say, when I'm doing a total hip, instrument company, when it brings the acetabular reamer, 95% of the time they are blunt. So I have to take out the hospital reamer, which are not being used as much. Then only you can ream the acetabulum, which is, which is probably harder. Any other questions before we go further? Sir, any inputs on osteoporotic shaft fractures? Uh, static locking, distal locking, yeah, uh, pertaining to that, sir. Osteoporotic is, is, the, is the issue that even if you put in a 12 number nail, and at times even 13 number nail I put in, still it is not nine, it is not tightly fitting. And then you have an issue. So I think and now I'm going to cover up this overkill in orthopedic is a must. We finish that and then we can probably talk on everything. Okay? Okay, sir. Security of a prime minister is never an overkill. Security of any head of the nation is always an overkill. Even an industrial in Mukesh Ambani's house, I pass by almost daily. Is under excessive security. There are, according to Google, 55 people are guarding his, his house near on the uh, Mount Road where I passed by. Kashmir lockdown was after scraping 370, according to Google, was one year, six months, and one day. Tens and thousands of additional Indian troops were employed and the internet was closed down. All these are the overkill in order to see that there is no problem occurs in the city. So, and this is internet connections were blocked for five months. Every part of the world, wherever there is an unrest, expect it. And at times even the phones were blocked. Overkill in the security of the nation Why not? It is a human Ultimately in orthopedics, if the fracture does not unite, it goes on for four months, five months before he undergoes the second surgery. He cannot walk about, move about, he cannot be comfortable. <laughs> Security of the time, the nail breaks down and they are stuck. So wherever they are, they have to undergo surgery. <laughs> so this is the must for a benefit, I feel. But if you put a nail and a plate on a supra fracture, it's an overkill. There are people who will say, this is too much of an overkill. We are treating another human being, poor or super rich. <coughs> <coughs> For all attempts at making him normal in the shortest time has to be the aim. This was a question which was put in to the full-time professor in a general hospital. An identical NHS hospital, which is again like our, our government hospitals in England. Why do an overkill? Why the person in a private practice do everything as the first surgery? Because you want the patient to walk about immediately and to have no second surgery. Because that improves your, your status and the patient is benefited. So overkill in human treatment is a must. I am somehow I come to this situation. Well, on day one when I operate, there has to be everything which should be done which you think is needed. Today I recommend all subproc fractures which are communicated. Please mark the word communicated. This I tried to put in a surclass. It wasn't very stable, so I put it on day one uh, hook plate. They are not necessarily stable with nailing alone. I strongly suggest they be treated with nail and adjuvant plate. This may be an overkill, but we are treating a human being and he or she has her own life, not only PM of the country. So overkill is not a sin. I hear this lady, with this, he starts walking about almost immediately. He starts walking about immediately. And her life is changed completely. She doesn't have to 
Sir, your screen has gone blank. Sir, if you don't, if you haven't picked it up, she is not going to be into the into the situations where. Sir, nothing is coming well. on the screen. Sir, the screen see? is blank. The screen is blank. Its slides are not seen. Your uh, only voice is audible. Yeah, I think I have to. Yeah. I have to report it. Yeah. Yeah, can you carry on, sir? Asim, Sangeet, and uh, you are there. Please carry on till the time I come back. Can I show my slides, sir? Yeah, yeah. yeah, please, please. Nitin, to the data, no, yar. Sir, bolte rehta, dikhao to jao karke, dikhate ja. Ha, sir, the maga shi mute kiya lata, sir. Is mute zala to. Sir, you are muted. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, sir, audible, audible. Ah, audible sir. Is this visible, sir? Visible, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Okay, this was a young patient, so I wanted to share few uh, X-rays of the elder snelling I have done for. Uh, Intertrochanic fracture uh, both ways with young patients, old patients, a wide variety of stable patients and unstable patients in last two months, sir. Uh, because we were discussing about the endosnail and Kellogg's also even commented that the, it is uh, not free of complications. So I wanted to show some uh, slides with complications and without complications also, sir. So this was a 32 years old male, communicated uh, unstable fracture, a 3.2, probably 2. This was lateral X-ray. This was the CT scan I had to to know the fracture geometry. And uh, this was the 3D picture. So this was the intraoperative reduction, CM pictures, AP and lateral. So I uh, plan to do endos needing for this patient. And this was the immediate post-op picture. It was quite stable. I didn't give any derotation boot or anything. And uh, actively heel dragging was started the same day. And this was six weeks post-op. Patient, patient is recovering very well. He has started partial weight bearing. Any comments, sir? That looks nice. This is AP and this is lateral. Nitin ji, badiya, badiya. Ekdam badiya. This is lateral. Uh, this is a 90 year old female. So this was fractured. IT fractured. This was the immediate pre, uh, uh, post op picture. AP and lateral. No derotation boot or any su ex external support. No limb leg discrepancy, no external rotation. 95 year old female. Fifth day, she started walking without pain. So again, another patient, 95 year old male, Sherke, a two point almost three uh, IT fracture. This was the immediate post of 
This is recently done. Another patient, 73 year old female, operated by elders with uh, turbo screws. Immediate movements, immediate knee dangling and active knee range of movement, 7th or 8th post of day. But please show the final x ray, Nitin. Yes, sir. Because unless there is a final x ray, this day one uh, function and the x ray is not a uh, full, full information. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, these are only six weeks x ray because these were done in the last two months. But I'll try to show one, one another patient. Seventy-three-year-old female, prominent unstable IT. Huh. Uh, this is what I want to talk about. This is not without uh, uh, complications or failure. This was the immediate post of picture. Everything failed. Why did and, you? Uh, I only had done, done this surgery, and this was iatrogenic complication because the nails were not of proper size. My student told me that everything is in place, but I didn't check it. That was my fault. And with whatever available to me, in this, I did this. But in property, it was good. But next day, when uh, the post of picture was taken, this was the picture. Then uh, I tried to revise that. This was the failed, failed uh, fixation. I revised again with Enter Nelson. So this is the, the post of picture. AP lateral. And this is six weeks post op, or nine, four weeks post op picture. The fracture is uniting. And this was today's picture. She was walking after six weeks comfortably. What is the diameter of the nails? Uh, majority of the diameter was 4.5. If the fourth nail, I, I used to pass three or four, majority of the times four nails, but fourth, sometimes it was 4 mm or 3.5 mm. But uh, first two or three were 4.5 mm, sir. You do on spiker table? You do on fracture table? Yeah, yeah, fracture table, sir. Sir, I have a question. Yes, sir. Yeah, madam. Sir, uh, uh, how, what exactly is the principle of weight bearing on uh, multiple endos nails, sir? Usually, previously, uh, I used to start weight bearing. I was very apprehensive or uh, skeptical about the outcome. I used to start after six weeks. I used to give derotation boot. But now I was okay. taking, I was starting a trial. I, I have okay. started it after seven, eight days also. If I think the fracture is uh, rotationally stable, right, and sir, the patient right. is uh, uh, conscious and cooperative. Got it. Can you say statistically how many people have failed? Sir, um, fail means it, uh, it's uh, ten percent, sir. At the most, uh, I used to uh, do it, sir, in my early days also, sir, years back. But I didn't do it much, only for high risk patients. Where in my private the anesthetists were not ready to give anesthesia. That time I used to convince them that I will take a small incision near me, and the blood loss will be only four, five, ten ml, and I'll finish it with the kid. That those days I used to do that. Uh, but failure rate is less, sir. Not much, sir. Only thing I have placed all the nails in subcontrol level. If you don't put that one failed where it was not put subcontrol, the chances of failure are very high, sir. You have a very good result. And as you know, I think uh, even Jawar Jetwa has been showing it a good result about these things. Generally, we invite him once in a while here. Yes. But uh, why it has not become universally popular? Any reason you think? Uh, sir, uh, Im immediate mobilization is uh, means it's a surgeon dependent and the fixation dependent, sir. The surgeon has to be damn sure about the mobilize uh, this thing, stability and mobilization. Because of that, probably. Nitin, sir, I have another question. It has not picked up much. Nitin, how will you prevent progressive migration of a cylindrical yes, structure in an osteoporotic vein when dynamic loading is done? Okay. And how uh, will you, uh, how will you also prevent the perforation of the femoral head or neck with a pointed uh, your uh, uh, that uh, ender's nail uh, on uh, loading? So there is yes, a sir. thing because there is in a subtrochanteric and intertrochanteric fracture there is a tendency to settle down. 
and suppose yes, it settles down where it will go and there are two rigid and stiff nails actually they are not very elastic nails and therefore Jawaharlal Jetwa why he is successful because he manufactures and uses a very elastic nail up a very particular metal and use a turbo uh, screws also therefore probably he is getting Guru's result but it has been started in 1970 by so many people and only now it is restricted to only a Gujarat people. So I think uh, it's not a very good method. There are so many CRM soups, exposure, difficult to pass through the fracture site. Many times it comes out to from the uh, fracture site and shatter to canter. So one or two, three uh, successes I have tried and I left it uh, control one up. Uh, I agree with you, sir. I also, yesterday also, the day we were talking about Chandek, sir. It's not a versatile implant, but it can be tried. Just I wanted to show that. As, as always, I don't try it, does, but it can be tried some, in some cases. And all I can say is, stray people from one small corner have been talking about it. Result, like what you mentioned, very good results about it. But since it has not become a universally accepted method as an option, like whatever the blade plate is an option. So, so there is something which is in it, which is either the statistical analysis is not available. Because if you do the statistics, I'll tell you at one stage, it was being done so frequently in Gujarat by the whole crowd. And slowly, people just dropped out. Now it is only probably few people are doing it and few people are who are uh, doing it. Probably they are more experienced and they are selecting the cases to do it. So there is something in it, but probably all of us are not used to doing it. So I think thank you very much Nitin, for showing us a beautiful way, another way of doing the job. Thank, sir, thank you very much sir, for allowing me to present. No, 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 I, I, everyone is allowed here. There is no hypocrisy. There is no there is no autocracy. Everyone is allowed to present. Thank you, sir. Sir, I have a one question, sir. Yes, yes. Sir, uh, how do you prevent uh, backing up the nails? Ah, okay, sir. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir, sure. Uh, you, you, usually, the eye of the endosnail, which is distally near the knee, I don't keep it inside inside the bone. I uh, keep it just uh, hugging to the medial femur record and one thing. And second thing I used to, from the beginning, I used to uh, uh, gather all the nail holes by, uh, together and uh, they were uh, put together by an SS wire. Put through all the holes and used to tie a knot over that and they don't usually move. Any single yeah. nail doesn't move. It has been reported that the nail backing out, nail coming and uh, really hitting into the inner side wherever you have passed in because it is quite percutaneous. So those are the complications which have been recorded about it. You have been lucky and you are probably you have been very expert at doing it and that's the reason you have been able to get a much better result. So I think I appreciate if more and more people do it and they find it better and better results, then probably the PFN, which has become a gold standard, will have a very good competition. I will be happy because I am not convinced PFN is such a gold standard. Sir, uh, I had a solution for backing up the nail. The K, uh, the K wire will be bended like a just hairpin like and we can pass on the holes and we can bang it to the candle, sir. So we can prevent the backing of the nails. That is, uh, we had experience with that uh, as nails. Gujarat, Gujarat people do like that only. Yeah, yeah. I, even I shared my cases way. also, sir, last time. Uh, last week I was shared my cases in our group itself. So in that group, uh, we can find out that x-rays, uh, there will be hairpin band uh, locking in the distally to the nails, sir. I will invite at some stage Dr. Jawar Jethua also here, who has been doing it quite often. And he has been uh, he has been teaching quite a lot of you. Quite a lot of you might have learned from him. Okay, we proceed further. Okay, sir. Yes, sir.
is this fracture. Terminated fracture, medially like this. Nail is passed, it's not a stable construct. Even if you had passed the nail in the neck, it would not have been that stable a construct. If there was no combination, this would have been a very good stable construct, no question about it. So this went through like this. Ultimately, it went into non-union. And that's the reason I put in the adjuvant plate, grasp, and ultimately, it held up beautifully. For in four years, it took. But see on day one, on day one, with this sort of a fixation, when this is, this is almost floating into the proximal fragment because of the communication, distal fragment, there is a decent hole. So at this type of a fracture, if you see day one, probably I'll augment this with the plate, the thing which was done for a non-union. I will not hesitate to augment this with the plate. So this overkill is probably the treatment of choice for this sort of a fracture. Terminated junctional fractures are unstable in only name, more non-union, the chance of, of a more non-union. So probably the overkill here is justified. Or the fracture here, this fracture is such a osteoporotic fracture and all, and this is the same way. You put in the nail and a plate and the patient walks about. Now here is the, this is the wife of an orthopedic surgeon, operated outside. You can see once you have done the PFN, everything is very good. This is a zero reduction. But you see, there was a peak which was here. Once you pass the PF and screw here, this is going to give way, which it, it gives way here. Once it gives way, now the proximal hold of the femur is very poor comparatively. And once this has given way, and that's why the whole nail ultimately broke down here. So that was very well treated with the PFN and the hook plate, and everything ultimately held up super stability. Nine months, everything becomes all right. So when I showed this case in the meeting, some of the commented it could have been healed up only with a positive reduction on day one. Yes, possibly. It could have healed up. But if you're ending up something like this, even on the table, I would suggest go ahead and put an adjuvant plate. Don't take a chance. This is his best chance to take a new normal in the first operation. When doing a second or a third surgery, can you take any chances? Overkill is only for half an hour of a surgeon and the patient has no time constraint during that surgery. Why should there be no overkill in first surgery? He spends four to five months and money for that first surgery. Now here you can see the canal femur for this sort of osteoporotic fracture which we're talking. This is the one, this is the one, there is nowhere it is holding. Particularly this is more osteoporotic here and that's the reason the nail hold is very poor in the proximal part. This is never going to really unite. So all see, see this combination. Again, the nail alone is never going to be. Can it ever heal up like this? You can see this same, this is the same factor. On day one, add up. Here you add up name. Here you add up play. Here you add up play. Then you have a best chance for healing up this factor. You may not do a graft on day one, but adding up a plate in such a comminuted factor or such a osteoporotic factor. I feel it's going to be firing a security. There is no harm in doing that. Now I come to the junctional fracture femur, upper two third and the lower one third. This is the one which is the commonest treated and commonest fracture with the non-union. You can see over here. Sir, we can't see your fracture one and a half here. Huh? Can't see, sir, your picture. So slides are not seen. Slides are blank now, again. Now is, the screen is visible, yeah. You got it. You see, yes, Chef Femur. Asim, can you carry on? I think I cannot handle it here.
Sankit, are you going to show anything? Mm. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. I need sir, some time. Friend. Yeah, Hajot. Yeah, sir. So when I do a femur nail on a traction table, I face the problem that the guide wire ends up medially. So I have stopped doing femur nail on fracture table, and I am doing it laterally. But how to centralize the nail distally? It, it always goes medially on a traction table. No, Harjot, I do it on the fracture table. I think Sangeet also does very rare. I do my revisions on ordinary table, uh, radiolucent table. Uh, fresh fractures, I'm most of the time, unless patient is very obese, I do on... Uh, so you adapt the limb while doing femur nail? Yeah. And how do you do... What is the pressure... Pardon? So tibia nailing, you do it on figure of four or... No. Or, uh, I, I use that attachment with, like arthroscopy thing, which allows me to hang the tibia. The upper okay. part of the thigh is supported and the leg is hanging down. Okay. And I just start the entry and then somebody else is reaming and showing in the nail. I just sit on a stool and hold the reduction and maneuver the things. So... Guide wire, somebody else is passing. Arjot, your issue is uh, the guide wire and the nail goes on one side, the usually medial side or lateral side. This doesn't happen in a proximal fractures or isthmic fractures. It usually happens when there is a excessive room for the nail or for the guide wire in the distal femur. So that means you are doing a junctional fracture, post isthmic. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. So you have to take care that your guide wire is centralized by whatever maneuvers you do either uh, that basically it happens because you have not reduced the fracture while passing the guide wire. You have not taken adequate precautions to reduce the fracture while negotiating the nail over the guide wire. So you expect the nail will automatically reduce the fracture. No, it is not going to happen. And last thing is I always use, uh, I always pre-bend the tip of the guide wire so that if it is going on one side, I can withdraw it and derotate and see to it that it is in the center center in AP and lateral. Is that clear? Sang Sangeet, AOS yes, has got a device which allows me without bending the guide wire to pass my guide wire in the different location. There is an instrument. And I think Indian companies also have copied that. So that allows your guide wire to be guided. Plus, as Sangeet rightly said, that tip of the guide wire has to be in absolute center, lower third tibia also. Most often people are nailing them in valgus, which is bad. It has to be absolutely neutral anchor. And that for putting a device, you will have to reel the proximal femur so that you will be able to pass that yeah. device negotiate the guide wire in the center. And sir, previously we used to use over rim say up to 12 and use a 10 or 11 nail as a joystick intramedial device. But now some companies they have already made an instrument which is something like 9 mm. So once you made the entry in the femur proximal part, you can use that instrument to have a solid control on the proximal fragment. Yeah, that is the same part of an AO. Yeah. So, yeah. it's a beautiful instrument they have created. I have the presentation. I, I was going to talk yeah. about it sometime. Yes. But as Dr. Sangeet mentioned, this nail, this guide wire going on the side, which all, all these are the maneuvers mainly into the junctional fractures because the lower down is the, as you can see here, is the wide medullary cavity. And that's the reason it happens. So you may have to use a polar screw at times if in case you cannot make it. So the polar screws will really help you out to put the guide wire into the center. I'll carry on with this junctional fractures. Now these are the fractures which are, you, now you can see my slide, no? Yes, sir. All clear. Yeah, it's very well seen. Okay. Yeah. This goes into non-union, so the treatment is again 
the edgeward plate and a bone graft. So here, after 24 months, this patient walked about. She was an orthopedic surgeon's wife, so obviously treated by the best person in the city. So the, just mm -hmm. because the successful surgeon treats it, not necessarily he is well informed. You can see the lower one third fracture. There is nothing which is there in this. That's the reason he is going to move about and walk about. So that's the reason this is going to sway around. You can see this fracture. When you put in this particularly two screws into this junctional fracture, this is notorious for going into non-union. So why this happens? Distal femur is a poor site for anti-grade nailing with two distal parallel screws. As the hold on the nail in the distal fragment is poor. You can see the CT scan. You can see the CT scan. The nail is floating in the lower end. I, upper end, it is there, the, uh, decent enough. But lower end, it is floating. You can see this nail. That's the reason there is hardly ever a hold of that. So today, what is recommended is junctional fractures, which are there, either do a distal femur nail. When you do a distal femur nail, there is going to be an excellent hold because this end is subchondral. This end is subchondral and that's the reason why you will have an excellent hold distally and the nail goes in the isthmus, so there is a good hold proximally. And these screws are additional. Three, four screws you can put in. That gives you a good idea. Or, as you can see, these are the three, four screws which you can put distally. But you can see after a distal femur nail, I was doing a video, there is no movement occurring. So I didn't do anything and this held up very well. But this is again, not all the time you will be successful. If there is a combination or if there is a wide medullary cavity, this may not still function at times. So today, now here was a combinated fracture. As you can see, a long oblique fracture. So day one, I put in a nail, I put in a adjuvant plate and the whole thing heals up perfectly well. I could put a distal femur nail because there is a tibia osteoarthritis there. That's the reason I chose this anti-grade nail and put in a mm -hmm. plate. So patient walks about with this. Radiologically, the healing process takes a little time, but this heals up ultimately and there is no issue at all. So anti-grade nail with three screws or four screws is what is recommended for this sort of a fracture. But even with these three screws, there is always going to be a possibility of a non-union. As you can see, so this was exchange nailing which was done, but then this ultimately ends up into a non-union. So the treatment is to be a medial graft, a human plate, and this ultimately heals up very well. This is after the removing of the nail. The medial graft, when I say because the weight bearing, when you pass the pass the line, when you do the orthoscanogram, the weight bearing passes like this from the femur. It comes here. Normal also. I'm, talk, I'm not talking about the virus. So it's always here. So there are, it has been shown that on the mm -hmm. inner side of the femur, there are osteoblasts and on the outer side, there are osteoclasts. That's the reason why it has been, uh, that uh, atypical factor occurs on the outer side. And you need the inner side. So I do this, see it on the femur. Find it out and do a shingling in anterior medial, medial and posterior medium, and put in a graft there. And then here is the incision for the plate. This is the one which occurred. So few people recommend anti-grade, multi-axial, multi-screws in a distal end. If anti-grade nail, this may be a better option, but not necessarily the best. And it is not always that it will function. This is the one which you can see again. It didn't function, so that's why again I do a nail. Same thing here, you can see the surgeon had done the knee, knee. same surgeon was uh, again was treated, this patient was for the fracture, he did the nailing, but you can see there is hardly any big function there. So he did the nailing, went to a massive non-union five months, I treated it with this compression and the grafting, but on day one, if after the nailing he had put in the plate, probably the whole thing could have been fully avoided. So this is not a good fixation. In a, today, it has been accepted by everybody that this junctional factor of upper two-third and lower one-third, where the medullary cavity is expanding, on day one, you, you should put in a nail and a plate 
for to be hundred percent. They want this Ajuvan plate would have been saved this Maharaj. Now all this you can see the pain fracture. Again you do the Ajuvan plate and it hits up. So why not on day one? This sort of a fracture do not accept. If you are doing us, if you are doing a distal femur nail, then probably may be all right. But for a safety sake, distal femur or an anti-grade nail, you can put in a plate and then you are almost 100% sure this is going to hit up. All these are the ones which is typically in massive number of non-unions are seen in this junctional practice. Or this sort of an oblique fracture approximately. This also goes into non-union. So ultimately it is treated by the adjuvant plate. So if you are in doubt at the end of the surgery like this, where the oblique fracture is going to go on and on and on, so the movement which will occur. So it's much safer to put in an adjuvant plate here. All these are the ones which works. When the non-union, the adjuvant plate works all the time, as you can see it very well. Now I'll talk about the tibia. The chances of non-union in the tibia with the intact fibula are higher. This is a debatable problem, but as you can see, this tibia, undisplaced tibia, so conserved, this did not unite. So ultimately the treatment was fibular osteotomy and the nailing in a dynamic mode. I have not put in any screws there and this is done. As you can see, the same thing here, nailed, but again it goes into non-union. So the treatment is fibular osteotomy and then put in a nail and then it becomes all right. So today, my approach is here, it is again the same thing, a nail, intact fibula went into non-union. You put in a short nail, dynamize it within a dynamic mode and the fracture heals up with the fibular osteotomy. I do a primary osteotomy of the intact fibula informing the patient. Again, it's an overkill, but I do this. If I do this nailing, I'll do the osteotomy somewhere at the away from the fracture and do a nailing in dynamic mode in a transverse fracture. Mm -hmm. This is the one which heals up. Now, this lower one third fracture, lower one third fracture with the fibula plate and three screws still. It goes into non-union. You can see because it's an oblique fracture. It's not as stable as a transverse fracture. Transverse fractures are very stable. While oblique fracture may not be stable. This, this is the fracture which I treated. You can see this is the video after, before the fibula plate. There is a movement occurring. So I put in the fibula plate. And I thought it will be still stabilized. But you can see this. Still I felt that it wasn't stable. So, I added up a plate. I added up a plate. Patient walks about, moves about, and in a short time, the, the only thing is the healing process radiologically does not appear that quickly. This is in five months' time, the patient is full weight bearing, walking about, moving about. So, radiological healing takes eight months' time or over one year time, but still, this heals up. Here is the second case. Long oblique spiral fracture. Excuse me, sir. So in fractures in these zones, there is often uh, angulation of the nail. If we do figure of four, then there is anterior angulation. And if we do it in hanging, then there is varus valgus angulation. And in both positions, yeah, monitoring is a bit difficult. So how to prevent that? Sorry, Arjun, can you explain your question again? See, <clears throat> he says that in these oblique fractures, long oblique fractures, yes. the, after nailing, they tend to get displaced. Am I right? How to, how to hold or how to correct the reduction. So on yes, your sir. right is a slide you where you can forceps. use the external towel clip or a reduction forceps to keep it reduced while nailing and locking. Exactly. Or you can use polar screws. Harjot. K wires, polar screws. As Sangeet, pointed out nail cannot reduce the fracture at these junctions, junctional areas. So all through the nailing and locking process, the whole thing has to be kept reduced and fractures at this site, I use nail, which is giving me four distal screws. Even the Indian companies, they make 
nails which have got option for four dis uh, uh, distal locks in different directions. They are all within first four centimeter of the subchondral bone. The time or the tip yeah. of this reduction force has yeah. to be strategically placed, understanding the obligacy of the fracture, then only it is going to work. So Otherwise, to judge that how exactly it will be put in there. And once you put in, and if you have a doubt, like I, as I said, on day one, I put in this thin plate. Again, the patient walks in. here. Here, there were three screws distally. You can see it here. But still, I put in the plate. You can see one, two, and three screws were there. But I put in a plate. Patient is walking about, moving about on day one, and the factor heals up. In, in past, or still occasionally, I put in this leg screw in this short of the practice. Put in this leg screw into the one cortex. And then do a nail. This is very old x-rays. Now, all of them, with this, you put in this nail and a plate, all this plate. This is uh, notorious for a non-union because, this, again, this is a junctional fracture with the treatment for this nail and a plate. Now, with all these sort of a junctional fractures, you can treat them very well with the leg screws and a plate. This is perfectly all right. You can if there is, but the problem here at times is so much of the swelling is there that you cannot put in a plate. And hence, that's the reason why you reduce the fracture, hold them with the clamp, and put in the screw, put in the nail with three, four screws distally. Still, I think nailing will be a better option particularly because this is going to be a very swollen leg, which you try to put in a plate, you may have a problem. But if it is there, then I think the nail and a plate and this sort of a thing also works extremely well. All what you need is a perfect, a perfect reduction and a good function is the aim of the surgery. If there is a swelling too much, then this can't be done. If at all you want to do this, this can be done within few hours. Then it will be perfectly all right. As you can see it over here, leg screw and the neutralization plate is an option in these junctional fractures if you feel that you don't want to do a nailing. But the nailing still is a treatment of choice. A human plate, put it or no, is your choice. Same thing is in the upper one third. I think Dr. Gadigune has talked about, a, beautifully has talked about the suprapatellar nail. But this upper one third is still notorious for a non-union. Here, unfortunately, that one screw is even outside. It's not in the world. But this is notorious for a non-union, even though a good direction was obtained. But then the treatment is this by double plating. Or you can see here, four screws proximally into this proximal fracture, still a non-union. Because this doesn't really stabilize a, such a fracture very well. Or distally here, four screws, four, five screws, one, two, three, four, five screws. And still, fracture doesn't unite perfectly well. And here was a polar screw. So, it's very simple, I feel, to put in an adjuvant plate. And that, that is a big insurance that you will not go through just because you have put in four screws here. Such a fracture, you put in a nail, proximal femur junctional fractures, possibility of a non-union, which occurred on day one, nail and a plate. Would have solved the problem. Okay, I think we come to the end of this uh, overkill. Any questions on this over? Sir, I just want to add one thing. Yes. You talked about distal femur nail efficacy. Most of the people will be misguided. They get what is a old short distal femur nail with uniplanar locking bolts and only two proximally and two distally. What you mean is a longish nail going up to the lesser trough and has five locking bolts in the distal uh, segment passed in multi, uh, is a multi-lock, uh, long distal femoral nail. The newer design is not the short two screw distal femoral nail. So there should not be any confusion. My, my position is yeah. distal femoral nail ends up subchondrally. Yes, sir. That is the biggest hold and the best hold is in that subchondral hole. The success of the distal femur nail to me is mainly because of the subchondral bone. And what you mentioned rightly, uh -huh. you can add up three, four screws, that will be the addition. Yeah. But that, the subchondral hold 
is the one which gives you the best stability in the digital fragment. Because using that nail as a standalone without a adjuvant plate right. is a different construct as against the old nail with a with an additional adjuvant plate. So uh, what Sir said, a subchondral hole, even if you have two screws in the distal fragment and an adjuvant plate is good enough. So yeah. you don't need that multi-lock nail. With, with, with the plate, it will be a good enough. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Patil. Uh, uh, another advantage of that supracondylar nail to me, it seems to be we are putting that nail and guide wire exactly to the center center. So in putting a femoral nail, we struggle to put that in the center by putting a uh, K wires or polar screws because the adductor uh, muscle force will be there. But here we are keeping it directly, the entry point is directly through center center. So it becomes one of the uh, advantages uh, uh, against the uh, anti grain knitting. Another thing, if you don't have uh, maximum assistance, so you can try this supracondylar nail plus uh, in uh, pregnant ladies or some obese ladies also. This becomes very easy. The only thing is the violation of the knee joint. But till now, I have not uh, any come across any infection in the uh, joint or so. So, so there are many from, advantages. Apart from the subchondral hold, uh, the size, the thickness of the nail is much more in that area. And the tip is not straight. Tip goes like this in the uh, intercondylar notch. So that is an additional advantage apart from what Sir has said. <laughs> Yes, sir. Crux is the large distal part of the nail. Yes. Recently, I have done seven, eight cases. I have stopped doing uh, femur interlocking and distal femur nail. I will share that in the next lecture. As I said, at one stage, the distal femur nail went into disrepute when the, when the distal femur plate came in. But when we saw the results of the bad results of the distal femur plate, so today I think again more and more people are doing a distal femur nail, which is a very good implant and it salvages you in majority of the times into this sort of a fracture. But again, this fracture, if it is terminated, then probably an H1 plate will be a better option along with this nail. And as, you, as Dr. Asim very rightly mentioned, nowadays the nails are available. If you can put in three, four, five screws in the distal fragment, depending upon where exactly is the fracture and how far the fracture line is really going down. Sir, in tibia adjuvant plate, you use 3.5 recon? Only 3.5. Only 3.5. Even I don't mind a recon plate. Because this is the one which is not a standalone plate. It's only... Uh, only uh, only rotation. And you put on the medial side by MIPO technique? Yes, MIPO technique medial side. On femur lateral side and 4.5 narrow locking. At times you may have to put in a distal femur nail. I mean, sorry, distal femur plate is the fracture is a little more distant. But as I said, though it is controversial, but about the distal femur, more and more people are coming around to that nail and a plate is a much safer option than any of the nails, even a distal femur nail. Yes, I think. Sir, there is one more advantage. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, a large series will be published probably one of these uh, days in this year only, where there is a 98% plus success rate with this combo which you just now mentioned, that a distal femur nail combined with an augmentation plate for these fractures. That will become the gold standard uh, in the published literature also. And once you are resorting to this dual combination, your reduction is perfect. When you are doing distal fever nail alone, in, uh, if you see the post-op x-rays of some of the experts who are doing large numbers, there is var varus, valgus, all sort of uh, posterior angulation, all sort of mal reductions are there, which, is, which are simply unpardonable. So, once you do a combo, your reduction is aut automatically far, far better. And Asif sir, Ji. Uh, while you are doing supracondylar nail, uh, if you open, if you mini open and hold with some uh, reduction. Uh, that is far uh, better than having a mal reduction. Uh, yes, sir.
Don't no, hesitate I mean, to do. That is true for distal femur fractures. That is true for subtrock fractures. IT I with mean, subtrock. Uh, Open it. Any of the times the surgeon puts the bolster below the knee. If it is put below the uh, fracture site, then it negates the gastrocnemius collar. That is also one of the reasons why it goes into the curvature. As sir rightly pointed out, opening the fracture is not a sin. Not reducing it properly is a sin. The incidence of malreduction is because very, very hard. the nail is loose in the isthmus. Yeah. So that is not a good reconstruct if you don't have a well-fitting nail proximally. So it has to have a good nail fit, uh, nail bone fit in the proximal fragment. If it is a loose nail, that construct is not going to work and distally you will end up in an angulation deformity. And, and if your point of entry is not good, so your point of entry has to yeah. be there into that point which is there. Unless and until it is into the perfect entry point, then only you will be able to be into the center center and you will hit the isthmus. And the nail bites the isthmus properly and the distance And as uh, I mentioned, all this Sir, there is disturbance in the background, sir. They are not. Uh, Inayat. Inayat. Sorry, somebody talked something. What was it? No, no, sir. There was some noise there. Now it's okay. You can go ahead, sir. Yeah. Any other questions about this? Why adding, ad, sir, why adding adjoint plane? Are we making the construct rigid? It is surprising. I was, mm -hmm. I was thinking that this will be a primary healing. But it is not as you could see in all the cases. You are seeing a good callus. So I think it is this construct is not that rigid. It is probably just adequate to give you a good callus healing. You are using the plate in a bridging mode. Bridging mode, yeah. Not a compression mode. And second, your intramedullary nail is again uh, in a bridging mode. So uh, that is the reason we get callus, adequate callus posteriorly and medially. Thank you. Sir. So, how much cortical purchase do you advise in that bridging mode? Like, like right. four ago and four below. Anything like that, sir? In a, in a, you are talking about the distal femur nail? No, sir. The bridging with the plate in a distal femur nail. Okay. Okay. The femur nail it is, it is obviously pushed just a little subcondral so that it is not, it is not coming out of the, um, of the bone. And sir, is, sir, his question is, uh, what is the adequate length of a plate, bridging plate or adjuvant plate what you will be using? Yeah, I think I put in mainly eight, eight hole plate. If it is not a badly combinated factor or a long of the factor. And that how many screws distally and proximally? Two or three screws, approximately two or three screws distal. Most of the time unicortical. Most of them are unicortical, but today I put one screw at least bicortical, 3.5 with the washer. Okay. Sir. Yes, I think you are saying something. We can't hold it. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, uh, muted. Nitin, Nitin, you, Nitin has a question. Yeah. Nitin, bye. Uh, uh, another you... thing, uh, uh, another thing regarding the anti-graded retrograde kneeling, uh, I, I just missed the point. Uh, in anti-graded kneeling, we just uh, somehow disturb the abductor mechanism, which is not in the, which is not the case with the supracondylar kneeling, because there will be some kind of pain. Patients complain of So that is an added advantage with Nitin, everything comes with a price. Here you are opening up the knee, you are doing an arthro that, that is okay. and yes. uh, God forbid if it gets infected, the integrate femur nail, hardly you will get an infection in the knee or hip if you have done a good job. Here, your joint is gone and to remove infected distal femur nail with a stiff knee is hell of a job. Yes, I agree. Sir. Nightmarish. 
but with, with recent aseptic techniques, in patients who has come uh, reduced very yeah. much less. Everything comes with a price. Yes. The sir was talking about eight or nine hole augmentation plate, usually 3.5. Uh, in the distal part, it's very easy to pass bicortical screws. I will use the hole number one, leave one, and pass in the three. Leave some holes in between, and at the top end of the plate, again, two screws only in the topmost, and one empty, and then third one. And most of the time, I can pass bicortical screws by some jugglery because it's yeah. easy to be intracortical. You can use the plate device. Yeah. You can put in the bicortical screws also on the side, which yeah. is even in an Indian plate also. <clears throat> now the I have removed a few distal femur nails. For a non-union, if you remove that, means the knee has become stiff, and that's a bloody hell of a job. <laughs> make, a, make a big bogda almost in the femur. Because to find out the nail, you have to be in the CM. Put in the guide wire where you are there, then because everything is filled up. So you have to make a big rope and to bite the lower end of the femur. It's a big hole, you need to dig it in the femur. So it is not as But still, it is quite scary. And if the nail, if the knee is not fully bending, then you cannot just execute it. So you have to, by hook or hook, you have to bend the knee, and then only you can remove this. this. So this will be the nail exactly as I've been mentioned. It comes with the price. And, and unless you do a good arthro, uh, cordyceps plasty and arthrolysis, whatever you may do, however strong your construct may be, your supracondylar or intercondylar will not unite till you have got at least 90 degree of knee flexion. Exactly. Yeah. Assume you are your... Dr. Gadigone, you are there, Dr. Chandak, na? Dr. Chandak, I see your name here. Yes, sir. Good evening. I am there. Any addition, anything? Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Aapka maun, maun hai kya? No, finish, no. Nahi, finish case. He was operating. <laughs> no, finish the case. But I was uh, listening to distal femur nail which I am not using. So I was just grasping the advantages of this. You device. must start using it. I am sold out to the new multi-lock nail. So why you are not using You would have somebody like you with a, with a wide experience. And a... So the, the, the last sentence, what you committed. So I, I prefer a surgery which even for revision or after a revision or when the case goes bad still can be redone very easily. Distal femur nail, the problem is removal and then redoing if there is something wrong. Therefore, therefore my, my use of distal femur nail is restricted to uh, very few of them. Instead, to me, going by a prograde nail, using a A2FN and providing a multi-lock in the very distal femur leaves the knee which is absolutely virgin for any futuristic um, things. I think I had the same hesitation for using it as it will be my nail after I used it so many and talked about it. But every time three, four or five nails once I took it out for some reason or the other, not in fact, I started a second product. But it's a much better nail than a proximal female. Yes. Any presentation, Dr. Sangeet? I think you, you were not there last time. You you have anything to add up into this? For a case discussion for us? In the chat box, there is a question. How to place uh, polar screws? Yes, yeah, yeah, so speciality. That is the reason he is asking. No? Yeah. <laughs> directly <laughs> requesting for his presentation. <laughs> oh, I was just trying to Retrieve that presentation. To answer. <laughs> no, no, he, he has got a nice talk uh, with uh, drawings and uh, geometry no, there. If you have that, uh, that, that presentation. Yeah. yeah just trying to take it out.
by that time any case is there negi sir case is sir chat paper non union ka to bahut hai bahut sara non union hai pura folder hai alag alag tarah ka which zone you want you just tell yeah <laughs> distal femur plate uh, dcs uh, nail with augmentation plate everything has been tried and used successfully if done properly sir what is the usual post op protocol for matlab uh, what you follow sir for nailing uh, when to start weight bearing when to start uh, 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 full weight bearing and all sir nailing in uh, isthmus fracture day one full weight bearing the terminated fracture supported nailing i mean supported with not weight bearing they cannot handle it in a badly terminated fracture if you have nailed Yeah, this is the female male. I always allow people to wear and that is the same. On a distal femur, this is the last, uh, or we are going to have more discussion or more presentation about a distal femur fractures. Are we going to have more? Uh, oh, daily. So we are talking about the. Uh, uh, junctional fracture, but the distal femur actually the distal femur per se is intra-articular. No, 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 no. What I am asking is, uh, are we going to have a separate session on distal femur? Yeah, if you want, you have it. It's your choice. Okay. If uh, Dr. Chandak doesn't want to present, okay. I have a presentation on distal femur. Day one uh, tips for plating. Go ahead, Sangeet. Or you can present first. I think uh, you already no, no. shared. No, no. Go ahead. Sharing no, the screen. To help the thing, you you go ahead. I I'll just uh, keep it ready. By that time, Sangeet, you can. Present. Okay. Okay. Screen. I, I have not shared. This is somebody. Sir's screen. I think Sir's was that. Yeah, that was Sir's screen. Actually, I joined late. Uh, Doctor Virun Gopal says. That question was before you joined, so I think that that must have been covered up the polar screw. If a polar screw details, I think we haven't spoken. Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll keep it ready. After yeah. Sangeet, I'll keep it ready. So, um, uh, distal femur fractures, getting it right first time. This is a talk. and that all depends on how well you have pre uh, done the pre operative plan planning now whether the ct scan is required in all distal femoral fractures yes because 40% of them could be missed and they could be uh, intra articular fractures like the hofas fracture and uh, this was already a discussion when you are doing a distal femur uh, this reduces the fracture most of the time the position is supine and a bump under the Uh, fracture reduces the fracture and a smaller sandbag underneath the hip aids in uh, uh, keeping the limb in internal rotation which has a tendency of going in external rotation now uh, the surgical approach usually for uh, fixing these fracture is a lateral parapatellar orthotomy where you do the open reduction of the articular block usually it is 10 to 20 cm incision uh, between the rectus femoris and the vastus lateralis retract the patella medially and then once you flex <coughs> you have the entire distal femur then you can do a intra articular reduction with the uh, reduction forceps temporary kyas which go across and reduce the fracture and then once you reduce you uh, pass the wires across and then replace them with lat screws and once you connect uh, the intra articular two condyles and then you connect that articular block to the metaphysis with the help of a plate now whenever you are using a uh, inter uh, frag screws they should not be in this area where you will have a footprint of the plate i'll come back to the footprint now what is relevant here and uh, 
is the anatomy of the distal femur. And if you have to see this anatomy, which is the key, whether you are going to plate, whether you are going to nail, is you must get a condylar view. That is, you should get a view wherein you see the blue manset line. The blue manset line represents the anterior and the proximal limit of the intercondylar notch. So what is in red is a blue manset line, which represents a intercondylar notch. So anything which is above that will be through the articular cartilage or it will be in the trochlear notch. And the white line posteriorly represents the intercondylar notch, what you see in the AP. So you need a good view where both the condyles are in one position. You are seeing that. You will not see this footprint or these two lines if your condyles are overlapping. So your plate has to be in that zone or your nail has to be again in that zone. So that your locking screws or polar screws, what you have used, they will not come in the way. Now, white arrows, they represent the subcondyl arc of the trochlea. The red arrows, they represent the intercondylar notch. And that should be the position of your plate. So plate within the lines would avoid condyle injuries, intraarticular screw penetration in the notch as well. Now, where do you put the plate on the lateral side? the lateral plate must be placed on the lateral slope of the lateral condyle. That is the normal footprint of the plate. What happens if you put there, all your screws will be through the intercondylar area. They will not grow, go in the trochlea or they will not go in the intercondylar notch. So a posteriorly plates may lead to a medialization of the condylar segment. So the violet area is the posterior placement of the plate and that will give rise to a deformity. In a lateral view, it will appear like this. And in the AP view, it will appear like this. The entire condylar block has been shifted medially because your plate is not in the footprint. It, is in, it has gone posteriorly. So the commonest deformity in the distal femur is medialization or the varus and that happens usually when your plate is not placed in the uh, area where it is designed for. So that is the gold club deformity. Second most commonest deformity is the recurvatum. So usually in extra articular fractures, uh, sagittal plane that is a recurvatum deformity is due to the pull of the gastrophemius on the condylar segment. And if you place a folded sheet or a sandbag or a towel, uh, folded towel underneath the fracture, so that will reduce most of the time the recurvatum. It usually happens in extra articular fracture, or you can use a sham spin into the condylar block to reduce it. So this is the commonest, second commonest deformity when you are do, uh, fixing these fractures. So a plate only corrects the fracture in a coronal plane. It does not restore. It does not res restore the length or the correct sagittal plane alignment. So, uh, varus deformity is because your last screw is not parallel to the condyle, tibial condyle. So, if you are aiming the screw obliquely, you are ending up in a varus, which is the worst complication, and patient will be having a painful limb, which is not acceptable. The second commonest deformity is a valgus deformity, which usually happens when your screw again is not parallel and your rotation of the distal fragment has not been addressed. So if the distal fragment is rotated, you'll see a fracture gap. You'll see a fracture gap suggesting either there is an axial or rotational deformity. Uh, very often, uh, when you have such a fracture, I think uh, there is a disturbance from JK. Uh, so length can easily be restored by just a manual traction or a universal distractor or a proximal TBL pin to get a reduction like this in a, a fracture, in simple fractures. However, when you have such complex fracture, uh, it is very difficult to judge, judge the length 
and there are two ways by which you can judge the length and the alignment now here i don't know whether i have shortened or uh, uh, it is in distraction when i am reducing this fracture so what is required is when you are fixing these fractures just look at the trumpeting effect like uh, you have a trumpet the distal femur is exactly like a trumpet and the distal uh, the proximal and the distal walls should be uniformly uh, spreading if you have reduced it well otherwise you will have a picture like this where you don't see a proper trumpet of the distal femur so that means there is something wrong you have not reduced it well so that effect you must try to see second way is checking the lesser trochanter and the proximal femur and the distal joint line usually uh, uh, you don't get a view in which you can see both the knees you can see only the some part of the knee the medial part of the knee now here is a such a view where uh, you can see there is a shortening that means this is the normal side where you see the part of the joint line medially and this is the other view where you see almost a inch of shortening so what you require here is uh, the alignment is required is a lengthening and that is what has been done after lengthening it properly both the joint lines are now at the same level and proximally also we have matched the two lesser trochanters which are at the same level so that gives you a rough judgment whether your length has been restored well so other ways of checking alignment is a cautery wire or a, a, a telescoping rod which has to be matched to the center of the hip and the ankle and the knee joint which is very difficult and once you do that then you connect the plate uh, to the distal block and then to the shaft large reduction forceps such as the king tong what we use in uh, pelvis fracture is a very useful for compressing the plate uh, flush to the lateral surface which remains off and that will produce a irritation underneath the iliotibial band so uh, the reduction tool for the shaft what can be used is a cortical screw wherein which will bring the uh, uh, shaft towards the plate thereby the plate will sit properly uh, uh, on the lateral side second is a helicopter effect that usually happens when uh, distally the plate is all right in the expected footprint but proximally it is angulated and that will give a wobbling effect because the screw is not bicortical it is not in the center it is on one cortex and that will give to a poor construct similarly distally if your plate is too anterior the extensor mechanism will be impinged and that will give rise to irritation and restriction of movement now these pre contoured plate are designed for a normal anatomical reduced distal femur so the plate has to be applied in a hybrid way wherein we use uh, all the locking uh, screws in the distal fragment and you can use a cortical and mix in match with the locking screws uh, three or four locking screws in the proximal fragment most systems are designed with the option to apply the implants in a minimal invasive fashion so uh, construct if you have a fracture like this uh, which is ex in some intraarticular a transverse fracture you can use the plate in a uh, compression mode and you can see uh, it has healed well in a expected time or if you have a complex fracture where there is a extensive comminution there is a intraarticular extension you have to mix the principle uh, of uh, neutralization that is some part of the fragments you fix it with the interfrac screw and then use the plate in a bridging mode and you can end up in having a good result like that so uh, we have to be very careful in making a decision what is suitable implant whether a nail or a plate here is a case which had a extensive comminution and a, a single plate has been used right from the lesser trochanter and nothing was done medially so subsequently at 6 weeks uh, we had to add a second adjoint plate like this and grafted so this is a rigid fixation and that takes almost a long time for it to consolidate that is the function of that patient he doesn't have a complete function 
a long plate, a long splining plate in a locking mode promotes callus by relative stability. Nevertheless, a loading of that is a must. Unless you load, you will not see the fracture whenever you are using plates or a nail in a bridging mode. Uh, another situation, you can see if you use a short nail in such fractures where the working length is short, you can see what can happen. The fracture has started angulating because the construct stability is poor. Or what Negi has mentioned, this required not two screws. It required multiple screws in a multi-direction. So that would have been a success of this distal femoral fractures. Another situation where you have to carefully choose the implant uh, the surgeon thought that in this fracture, ideal implant would be a, a nail, which he tried to use along with uh, interfrac screws uh, to fix the intercondylar area. And look what has happened in the lateral view. The entire nail along with the proximal fragment has moved out. And what is left is behind is the two condylar fragment. And that required revision with a plate wherein uh, this is the longest plate available on that day at that time. So this has to be revised. And the second surgery is all, not always as good as the first one. It ends up in issues and problems. He requires a secondary adjuvant plate later on since uh, he, had, he was hemodynamically not stable following a long surgery. So that is a second surgery. You may end up in a complication if you don't choose a proper adequate implant. So that was uh, how you can avoid complications on day one. What are the useful things to uh, take care uh, and avoid those deformity of distal femoral fractures? Um, sir? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, would you con uh, when exactly would you consider a medial adjunct, sir? Uh, when there is an extensive comminution. Now, uh, if your other implant, whether you use an intramedullary implant or an extramedullary implant, you are not happy with the construct stability. Right, sir. Okay. And uh, uh, you can get away with an uh, adjuvant plate if you have done a combo on the other side. That means you have used an intramedullary implant and you use the lateral adjuvant plate. You can get away with that. But okay. combination on the medial side reduces, uh, decides whether you require adjuvant plate. In those two, three cases which I have shown, all of them required an adjuvant plate because there was an extensive combination which has not been addressed. And the second most issue is uh, you create a gap, you create a defect because you have not reduced the distal fragment very right. well. Right, so yeah. So, because most of the issues you addressed in this presentation uh, are seen very commonly, sir. I think with uh, especially varus reductions. So, is there any any surgical pearls you can tell us to reduce varus? The disc, the first screw has to be parallel, provided your reduction of the condyles is uh, anatomical. Okay. Parallel joint line. Got it. Got it. If the plate is not Exactly about one finger plate from the articular surface of the femur. Right, and it will go into virus. We, because as, as beautifully here they explained, unless the plate is at the proper place, right. from the articular surface into that slightly uh, area which is there into the poem, uh, in the center, then only it will remain into the otherwise you will get the deformity all the time. Right. So. Thank you. Uh, Sir, sir, may I add one thing? Surgeon has to be familiar with the implant he is using. Lots of uh, Indian companies, they are copying Zimmer, Synthes, yes, sir. And, Nebu, and each one has copied in his own way. So you should exactly right. know where to put the implant you are using. The placement is slightly different for these plates. Each implant. Sir, right. also, uh, like you mentioned, sir, the DFLTP is a slightly, uh, it's a high profile implant only, you know, so it's not a very low profile. So is one cortical screw sufficient to get the uh, plate flush with the bone all the time, sir? It, you, you don't want always that plate to be flush with the uh, bone. At times, it oh. will lead to lateralization of the shaft. Right, Sometimes right. you want to maintain that space so that it doesn't 
uh, get more reduced in the coronal plane. Okay, sir. Okay. Pranjit, if I ask you, yes, sir. You are double plating primarily on day one. <clears throat> I was going to ask you. Sir, usually what happens in this, this is a part of an injury where we have fixed the other fractures. And at the end of the surgery, uh, either you know the patient is not stable or the surgeon is tired. So, or the soft tissue here in that uh, one, one other case, patient had a poor uh, soft tissues on the medial side. He had a wound on the medial side. So that was the reason the surgery was delayed. I'm not asking about that. that. That is a very, very definite indication which you mentioned. But isolated distal femur fracture, which is, a, which, is a, which is not a compound fracture, when will you consider double plating on day one? Uh, it's the size of the combination, sir. So if there is a gap on the medium, about uh, more than two centimeters or more. Center. Inch, a defect on the main poor quality bone, a low, uh, low fractures where uh, osteoporosis, low fracture where my distal screws of the lateral plate are not no. adding. That means if I have less than three screw purchase of the long plate on the lateral side, I'll definitely add a second plate on day one on medial side. I repeat osteoporosis low supracondylar fracture and defect which is more than two centimeter and number of screws in the distal fragment in a primary plate is less, I will add second plate. So any role of bone grafting, primary bone? No. Almost no. So uh, question to Sangeet. Yes, is sir. virus a more problem or actually what you get is a valgus? After distal femur locking plate. Valgus. So to me, when you appropriately the distal femur locking plate, the problem is getting more valgus rather than uh, having more virus. That is because, the, because no. there is the inherent valgus in the plate by the manufacturer. No, no, yes. no, 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 that is not the reason. Uh, what you are doing is you are bringing the bone to the plate. I'm getting you. Yeah, that is plus, plus Sangeet, people, people are not careful in passing that first guide wire for the central screw. Apart Height of that screw, as Saab rightly mentioned, about 1.5 centimeter above the articular surface, where it should be placed. And it should be banked parallel to the articular surface. There is no compromise. Apart, you are doing if you don't do that. Apart from that, your reduction is compromised. That is the second commonest reason why you end up in a valgus deformity. Which screw you put first, sir? Distal screw or proximal screws? Distal screws. And how many? Four, five? One or two. Then uh, connect the plate proximally. With the cortical or locking screw? Depends on how far it is off the plate of the proximal fragment. Now, sometimes the proximal fragment comes uh, lateral when we put the cortical screw. Then we should put locking. It, it, it doesn't make a difference because there three or four screws are adequate. Whether you use a cortical, depending on the quality of bone, younger patient, you can use a cortical, all four cortical. Elderly, you can use a locking or you can use a mix and match first cortical to bring the bone to the plate and then rest locking. And that first, if you are doing a bridge plate, then that first screw has to be at least about two centimeter, one inch above the most proximal fracture line. So you calculate. At times, you don't want a cortical screw to pull the plate bone towards the plate. Sometimes I keep a periosteum or some spacer between the bone and the plate. If plate stays away, it's fine, but the reduction cannot be compromised. It has the axial alignment has to be good. So, so I'll pass a locking screw and intentionally keep the plate. 580 millimeter away from the plate, bone away from the plate. So the recommendation is the plate has to be same equidistant. If if distally it is getting compressed for some reason, then proximally also it has to be flush with the bone. 
if proximally you are keeping a 5 or 7 millimeters distance, then distally also it has to be at same distance. And if this is maintained, then virus and valgus does not happen. That usually happens when you have a short knee. Okay. The plate remains off because you have a, uh, you're not correct at the alignment. Okay. Good. So one, one, one just observation. Only hey, Chandra, sir, some, only one. Chandra sir, somebody yeah. in between asks whether you do a primary bone grafting. 10 to 10% I do double plating on day one for the indication which Sangeet very precisely pointed out for those indications. But I don't think I have ever even thought of primary bone grafting. Do so, you ever do primary bone grafting for a fresh fracture? So basically, uh, we have to judge a case. Very rarely it would happen that the patient is absolutely stable and you have a lot of communication, there is bone void and patient is all stable and you want to do everything in one sitting. He is a primary farmer from village who cannot afford a second surgery. I think a very rare uh, scenario can be picked up where you can do a primary bone grafting. However, I do a primary delayed bone grafting in the sense in compound culture where there is already a bone loss. All of us. I would, I would prefer a metabolic IRB, metaphysial and epiphysial bone block, fix it up, put a bone cement spacer, 10 days, 15 days down the line when the things are settling, remove the cement spacer and put bone graft and finish it off the case. So this would be the way I would like to proceed in some of these patients. You won't wait for six weeks as it will mature the membrane and... So the the membrane is matured by as early as 15 days. 15 days. Maximum it is at 6 weeks. Yeah. <laughs> right. Other observation is when you say about the valgus position or the bone which is shifting on the lateral side, that happens when there is a shortening of the femur has occurred. Okay. Because there is too much of combination, you haven't elongated the fracture to the normal length. Then when you then there is a shortening the femur plate is very much flush to the bone in the proximal part and it will be, it will be really lateralized. So as soon as you give a traction, now the whole thing will come back into the position and then you will not see the lateralization of the proximal part. Right. That shortening is one of the major, major reasons why this happens. Sir, so the plate is anatomical. It has to sit on a normal femur. Normal. And unless you aligned it, Unless you correct all the deformities, it is bound to have uh, remain off. So, Tagda assistant must full, pull it full length. That is what you mean to say. Distractor. Or femoral distractor, which is quite less often used. I am. Okay. Any other question? Do you want to present now? Okay, you to, you yeah. Want to yeah, I can present, sir. Because 10 o'clock already. I am just present. Yeah, yeah. I hope the presentation is seen. Yeah. So just presenting the thought process of putting polar screws for proximal tibial fractures. So the most common problem with such fractures, and as Tanna sir uh, many times emphasized that for such fractures, a plate can also be a very good option. And that was my observation also. Most of the time, in spite of taking all the 10 fundamental principles enunciated by Tornata, many times this big remained anteriorly. And there are various reasons for it. The, the suprapatellar nail may obviate uh, this problem. So the problem is this is a difficult fracture to treat and this commonly happened. So many times I tried to do all the things and the anterior translation, slight shifting and as Harjot wanted to point out, some angulations happening in two different planes. And this anterior translation bothered some of this patient and couple of non-unions also because of this gross anterior translation. And this patient I had to revise this much amount of the uh, anterior translation was there. I did not do any interfrag. I did not use clamp in this case. And this is my retrieved case uh, long years back. And nowadays, <clears throat> to avoid that, for long oblique fractures, my first point would be to use a clamp, which would keep it clamped and then pass a nail. Even then, 
what happens this guide wires when we pass this guide wire take this trajectory so the whatever you use either a guide wire or a reaming whatever you use this takes a trajectory and which hits the posterior part of the cortex <laughs> even if you use a polar screw passing and reaming bit anteriorly is difficult unless you use a rigid uh, hand reamer so this is what the problem is and the recommendation is uh, i will go along with one or few recommendations as well that the herzog's band should be higher and that is what most of the nails are doing nowadays but this is a common scenario <clears throat> how to avoid it so one is getting a higher herzog band and when you take the c arm shoot in a lateral view when we are passing the nail at this junction it goes bit difficultly so try to bend the nail posteriorly so the proximal end try to get it more posterior towards the <clears throat> hip of the patient so that the tip of the nail is not jutting the posterior cortex it should jut the anterior cortex i have done combination of couple of these patients where it by hammering if it is not going and i did all those wrong things and it broke the posterior cortex also and this is another scenario if i am not clamping this also happened in a comminuted zone even if i put the clamp this was not holding so these were early problems which which before the use of polar screws were very common <clears throat> to avoid uh, what has been recommended is to use a posterior axis distractor so it requires around 10 minutes of setup time but is useful and a good reaming system i use a stand alone reamer so that we can rim in uh, the way we want <clears throat> so this is what is the problem so what tornado pointed out is to take a high entry point it is really high and bit posterior however when we start reaming with a flexible reamer it starts reaming anteriorly anteriorly and the entry point comes lower down so this is the philosophy if you take a medial entry point this is from the presentation of papers from the net so this is what commonly happens so this is a medial entry point it angulates and this translates in this particular fashion this was a famous experiment in the sawbone which is uh, there in the literature and see what happens if the entry is just shifted laterally so lateral to the lateral tibial spine just medial to the lateral tibial spine and it automatically aligns so whenever you have a fracture like like this and obliquity in the plane like this this is the best entry point and <clears throat> we have to realize that isthmus of the tibial canal is lateral to the midline of plateau so isthmus of tibial canal is lateral to the midline of plateau and therefore this is the lateral tibial entry point and for polar screw <clears throat> what you need four things i usually would be having a drill bit of all sizes and length shan spin 3.2 mm screw and stinman pin stinman pin is very useful for putting polar screw and this diagram i like very much and i hope every one of you would <clears throat> have this diagram in the theater and this is from the paper by muthu swami i think he is from india only for the application of multiple screws so imagine this to be the proximal tibia this to be the distal tibia and now you want to put polar screw just remember the reverse rule of thumb technique so look on this tibia he is putting the thumb to correct the deformity so imagine this bone you are correcting the deformity and wherever you are correcting the deformity where you would like to place your thumb opposite that point is the polar screw so very simple to remember and i pasted this diagram in theater it, it makes <clears throat> life very easy and you remember it very well and anybody who is joining you in the theater and even the ot assistants also remember very well where the polar screw is to be there so that becomes very simple and the basic logic behind the use of polar screw all of us know that it is reducing the width of the canal blocking the nail not to pass in that passage and increase the mechanical stiffness of the bone implant construct so all these things are done by a proper polar screw at the end whether you remove it you retain it or you put a good screw depends on your philosophy so this was a low herzog bend translation so could have been held by a polar screw 
and then this would not have been done or using a clamp, whatever uh, we can use. So the, again, diagrammatic representation, how, where a polar screw is good, what happens if it is not used. I also like to use two 10 mm pin 2.5 or 3 mm and keep this fragment well opposed to the main fragment. That also is a very useful to say, take two statement pins away from the zone of nail and keep it well opposed. Uh, distractor is another beautiful thing. So where are you going to use a polar screw? So have a thinking process in use and the use of polar screw is at this point where you don't want your nail to go. So nail is then going anteriorly. And then put 2.5, two statement pins, keep the reduction well opposed. So one polar screw here, <clears throat> and you want you don't want your nail to go into this position. So use a polar screw here. So this is the way a polar screw. And of course, a sweet spot that is the high entry point. And I like to use a channel rimming here so that the rimmer is not gradually translated anteriorly. That usually happened when I was not using a channel rimming. The reamer, since it is flexible and it is making an anterior C, so it keeps on reaming the entry border. So if you use a channel reaming, then that does not happen. So use a channel reamer, use nailing in extension. And this is how what is recommended to use nailing in extension, the pillows or soft uh, cushions or triangles. This is Tornetta's diagram. <clears throat> or I like to use a modular stand which you can make of different sizes and different shapes. So I use a <clears throat> stand. The advantage is somebody can give a traction on that stand either in 1990 or semi-extended. And that serves very well. And, and that is the way you can uh, reduce your translation if you're doing nailing in extension so that you can translocate the patella or shape the patella and the axis of uh, guide wire and the axis of nail is quite comfortable. And this is what I wanted to present with the polar screws. And then you can use polar screw. And what Harjota asked was, when there is angulation happening with the guide wire, which is flexible, you can use either a hammer to shift it onto one side, put polar screw, use all your methods and give traction in appropriate alignment. And then the final site of the guide wire, where you want to land, that is another good thing to avoid angulation. <coughs> This is what is the picture during uh, the nailing procedure. The, the nail tries to hit the posterior cortex and this is the crux why there is a problem in the proximal tibia nailing and we want to let it go more horizontally. So this is what um, uh, is the requirement. So when I am doing a proximal nailing and the nailing and proximal locking, I like to put it on a stand and uh, then nail it. May put a two stinman pins so that the fragment is well coapted. And closure can also be done on a mini height on a stand. And while closing, if tibia is developing swelling, I like to elevate them on a <clears throat> sort of a triangle so that the swelling is minimized. This is what I wanted to present about uh, the uh, polar screws. Sir, you use screw or steenman pin? So, initially I continue to do till the end with steenman pin so that uh, we have a hold. It doesn't the, break. It doesn't break. And at the end, I would just remove the pin and convert it to a screw. So, do you remove a polar screw then once uh, its purpose is solved? If it is a well placed, serving well, continue to keep it. Because that also gives you a mechanical strength. You need to correct the deformity. Yeah. Then the so once the roll is over, why do you want to keep it? It is better kept. It, it reduces the size of the canal. It reduces the size of the canal. It for so toggling. No, no, no. That would, so that would be effective uh, in the proximal and the distal most areas. Yeah. Okay. Where uh, you are increasing the stability of the construct by adding screws by the side of the nail. Here, you are using it towards the isthmus. Yes. Still, I like to keep it if it is well placed for whatever reason. And also it becomes good to write down that 
a good modern technique was used. So in spite of that patient developed some problem, uh, you have a <clears throat> notes where you did everything to two or five percent patients still have some residual um, okay. more. So when you see a check x-ray at around six weeks, not everything is absolutely rosy every time. Some minor problems uh, remain. The most common remains a bit amount of valgus at the distal end. In spite of doing, in spite of doing everything. Chand Chandak, sir, yeah. there, there, there are suggestions that you can use a mini plate in these difficult areas, junctional areas, and then nail almost an intact tibia. Have you ever tried that? So what happens at end uh, at around six weeks when the patient comes, then you have a reverse thought process. I should have done this. But actually, when we treat primarily, we are happy at the end of obtaining a good reduction. And CM does not show the full length of X-ray. That is one drawback of CM. In spite of having a 9-inch or a 12-inch CM, <clears throat> you are seeing only a section of tibia. But when you analyze the X-ray, <coughs> the X-ray is a whole, whole length. And then uh, this uh, deformities are noted. It is, it is mainly because of the brainwashing of the MIPOS people who been very strongly talk about MIPO, MIPO, MIPO. Don't open the fracture. As Asim mentioned just now, proximal tibia. Most, most useful thing is a small mini plate. Yes. Or nail, whatever you want to do. Remove the plate or keep the plate, whatever it is. Same way I would say, in a distal femur, you, as you very rightly mentioned, distal femur, if you have a problem of uh, alignment, polar screws will not give you that 100% alignment, as you very rightly mentioned. That you are, at the end, you feel, yes. and if you put in a plate, you will get a 100% reduction. Yes. And once you get that 100% reduction, the healing of the factor also is yes. going to be very, very helpful. Okay. And that plate, if you put it, I, I'm sure as an experienced surgeon, you're not going to open up all the periostrums and everything. You're just going to, with the, with the joystick, you reduce the fracture, put the plate, stabilize it, and that's it. Any questions? Next time, got topic care. Yeah. I will talk about Hoffa fractures. It's a beautiful collection of Hoffas done differently. Whenever it comes, distal femur. Yeah, I think the shaft part is almost over today. So we go down to the knee. Okay. Even, even, even distal femur today, he has beautifully yeah. spoken. Yes. Lots of things Sangeet has nicely covered. That was good. You speak about OFA, Patella. Yeah. Those things and then we'll uh, probably the upper tibia. Jignesh. Huh? Jignesh. Uh, 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 sir, about the Patella, uh, uh, about two months back, I had uh, heard a AO seminar and I felt that I'm doing something very obsolete. The uh, in thing was uh, fiber wires and uh, Cannulated screw combined with uh, tension band and so on. There are patella problem I do the way you, you have taught me and I have not removed more than 1% of the implants. Your technique works beautifully. Why are you bothered about? But I felt very uh, ancient, those people talking about it. <laughs> Fighting plate. Star plate. Star plate. Plates, they were not gaga. They were gaga about cannulated screw combined with uh, tension bands uh, and uh, fiber wire also. See, fiber wire is a very, very easier way to put in the things. It, it is also the expensive way to put, put in. But the fiber wire and, and, and a, or a future wire, technically, does it make any difference? Yes. I don't think technically it makes any difference. I mean, functionally. Yeah. But I think we keep on doing whatever we get a good result. Good result. 
and and with figure figure o and figure eight wiring we are getting very excellent good result <clears throat> so why to change chandak sir he does it differently little uh, uh, unless there is combination he doesn't use k wires he uses a combination of surplus and a tension bend and there is very little hardware prominence and almost every patient is in crab bandage on the same day and has 90 degree on the uni but so, actually it is a extension injury of extensor expansion and it requires some time to heal so they may show one or two patient for presentation that is different patients are not that happy bahut dukhta sir pata nahi sir hum to sab patela ko karte hain karte hain but dukhta bahut hai unko hai na pata nahi they're painful yeah orthopedic injuries are painful they takes almost 8 to 10 days for that pain to diminished for them to be get going tumhara your anesthetic is not very efficient no anesthetic is efficient sir but then what i am speaking about is the reality which we face and then i will do so blocks yeah so uh, would like to see something on that uh, also so i am ruthless uh, almost every tibial condyle every distal femur has so, to condyle. do 90 plus on day uh, one or two yes, tibial condyle mobilize very well the reason is you are giving a perimeter which is completely fixed up but in patella it is the extensor expansion and the soft tissue which is torn so that remains painful soft tissue which is torn is usually painful expansion or no No, we suture the expansion. Ah, because once you have stepped up the expansion, that means you have neutralized all the force. So it should not be painful. Uh, but but I find them to be painful when you are mobilizing them uh, on day one or day two. Actually, Chandra sir, a small story. Yeah. I was his registrar in Bharti IT Aid. So, अभी तुम पट्टी कर देगा ना कुछ तीन टुकड़ा पटेला का था सब कर देगा. So he was taking coffee and he came back. कि ये छोकरा भी पट्टा लगाने वाला आई वॉज न्यू सो अभी तुम इसको क्रैप बेंडेज दे दो दैट वॉज एटी गुड नाइट सर होपुली मीट यू ऑन नेक्स्ट थर्सडे या थैंक यू गुड नाइट सर थैंक यू बाय 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 The one the nice. monthly get is with the video on rest or all with video off. Any particular reason? I think it's like Nagi sir. Sabi gaya ho jata wo lo. Ram karke. No, it will not happen. I mean, there must be either some, some either there in. Um, I just fail to understand because a direct observation and direct questioning would give the more and, teaching. And, and more people process. presenting cases and asking questions is the way basically. Honey, they would be benefited more if they are they they remove their uh, either it is um, whatever it is hesitancy hesitancy whatever it is. See, Doctor Doctor Patel is there. He is asking more question. He is more in, more interactive. Very few people. We are seeing the same faces. Yeah. Yeah, but then they can come out with their videos on. It same is, two faces every Thursday. So it is for them to ask questions also, and. Uh, So the other way is we can ask Tanna sir to ask them questions. <laughs> <laughs> That is the only way. No, doesn't matter. He say if they are in their chamber or in their hospital or they are at home. Doesn't matter. No, we know that it is a Zoom presentation. And uh, but I think I think they would be more benefited. And it makes a lot of good sense. We know them personally also. Yeah. Ch 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 Chandak sir, actually. You, me, Sangeet, we also learn quite a few things during case discussions. Yes, and therefore, yeah, yeah, sir, you can do it. Yeah, there, therefore, we are. There, there are ideas. We learn from them. Lots also. of new things. We also learn from them. Uh, we learn from them. We learn from questions, and therefore, we stop our OPD and OT on that day and come down. So we yeah. learn definitely. Every point teaches. Like Sangeet's presentation. uh throws a lot of uh, new insight into our it, mind. It, it, What to look for in when you are fixing next. I, I I videographed his presentation to send it to my son. <laughs> it was so good. I saw one or two slides, and then 
switch uh, switched off switched off my video so that i am not seen there and film the whole thing and i'll send it to the boys <laughs> so not copyrighted sir yeah man he will give it to chiku he knows chiku since he was like one year <laughs> plus he is a born teacher so he won't mind students learning from it but 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 there are good interesting questions as well so questions yeah. are good <clears throat> questions are very good and i think as a teacher we are learning orthopedics throughout our life we we are stimulated only if we are asked questions yes okay. definitely ask questions and that to difficult one like sangeet so so i think it's a it's a good platform to learn it's a good platform to throw upon our thought process to show our cases everything i think it's a good opportunity for everyone and 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 to start with it's very good then only you can go on the bigger platforms yeah. here it's like a family yes and then and in in a small group it's it's something like a eos uh, small group discussion yeah yeah <laughs> Where... chalo good chalo. night good night good night sir good night professor subha operate kar raha hai sangeet kal yeah sir ne aaj bhi kiya na elbow aaj ka hi tha sir ka <laughs>